Trump's vicious bigotry is despicable. And we are now advised to be afraid of the prospect of him becoming president. Indeed, that would be horrifically destructive for this country and many, many innocent people would be hurt. Yet, I refuse to be afraid of him. Trump wants us to be afraid. He needs us to be afraid. He believes he can intimidate anyone into submission. He's a bully, as all conservatives are bullies. He lives for this, he thrives on it. But I'm not going to give him my fear. He's not worthy of it. His slavering followers are already behaving as if their fear is in power. They're already assaulting anyone they catch disagreeing with them. His fans already believe that tomorrow belongs to them. They're already earning their armbands. University of Massachusetts Amherst PhD student Matthew McWilliams recently conducted statistical analyses on authoritarian beliefs and behavior within a framework of political support for the Donald. McWilliams's work is fascinating because it shows us how authoritarian behavior is triggered in both those prone to authoritarianism and in those who are normally non-authoritarian. The research McWilliams describes explains not only why Trump is a favorite with overtly conservative Americans, but also explains things like the lingering popularity of Clinton among self-proclaimed liberals. It's fear, fear of change, is what turns us away from progressivism as individuals and as a society. As long as we're ruled by fear, we will continue to be ruled by wealthy bigots. Apparently, a third of Trump's followers want the entire LGBT community deported. To this, I might say, Okay, how soon can I leave? I volunteer to be among the first queer Americans deported from the United States. Personally, I can't wait to return to Helsinki. I look forward to going back to Finland, which I've discovered is my true home. Finland where an openly gay Green Party MP in a civil partnership with a man from Ecuador came in second in the last presidential election. Finland, whose two most famous visual artists were both queer, one of them a bisexual woman who was part of a linguistic minority. She illustrated enormously popular children's books. The other? drew homoerotica that you can now buy at the post office. Of particular interest to me is McWilliams' point that the authoritarianism trigger is not really focused on specific prejudices, such as homophobia or xenophobia. I've been saying for years that while conservatism is typically conflated with certain religions or political parties, it's actually a world view, and as such, it transcends individual backgrounds. Conservatism, with which authoritarianism is intimately linked, is a world view based primarily in dominance. Control, per se, is not as central to this, as neither real nor perceived control is nearly as important as an unshakable belief that you, the anointed ones, deserve control because you are superior to them. Conservatives are compelled to believe that they are inherently superior to the enemy. Hierarchy is the foundation of this, believing that social order can only exist with a privileged view at the top 
and those who are different from you fully deserving to suffer and die at the bottom. Despite an insistence that the activation of authoritarianism is somehow separate from bigotry, the fact is that authoritarianism is triggered by othering people. You can't activate this behavior without using marginalized groups as first social, then physical targets. Anyone who isn't a rich, white, Christian, cishet man ignores this at their peril. Under a regime like what Republicans propose, if you're not rich, they will send you off to get killed in a war that they're profiting from. If you're not white, you'd have to be Clarence Thomas to protect yourself. If you're not a cisgender heterosexual, the best you can hope for is deportation. If you're not a man, you'll be subjugated to men like the women of the Republic of Gilead. Canadian author Margaret Atwood foresaw this three decades ago when she wrote The Handmaid's Tale. Are we finally ready to listen to her? In some ways, the mess the U.S. is in is quite complicated, but our current options temporarily simplify a complex subject. If you are not petrified by the idea of everyday Americans working together to build lasting positive change, then on some level you have already decided to vote for Bernie Sanders. If you're not content with the status quo, your only logical response is voting for Bernie Sanders. <laughs>